Well, good morning, everyone. It's so great to see you. Welcome to Epic Church's online gathering. But as you can see, I'm actually physically present here at Epic's building. We have a really special Sunday in store, and I'm so excited that you guys have joined us this morning. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Carlene Halleck. I'm the executive pastor at Epic Church, and we're just thrilled that you joined us wherever you're at, whether you're at home or you're in another state or you're in another country across the globe. I know we've got several that are a part of our gathering this morning that are in various continents that have joined us. And so it's just so good to be able to gather this morning. We are going to be celebrating a baptism at the end of this gathering. So you can see the baptismal here behind me. But before we get started, I want us to just, as we're gathering together, be reminded that it's the Holy Spirit that draws us and we have unity in him. And so we are going to start out by singing this worship song called, Oh, Praise the Name. Let's worship together. Well, we've been in this series called The Disciple Making Difference. And I want to read these verses from Matthew 28, 18 through 20 that says, Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And if you just jumped on our gathering this morning, we're so glad you're here and we're so excited. We're gonna have the message this morning and then right after the message, stay on the Zoom gathering because we are going to be celebrating together as an individual takes their next step in being baptized today. You can see the baptismal here behind me. We're so thrilled to be able to share and to celebrate as disciples are making disciples who make disciples. Now, our mission statement here at Epic Church is living in and living out God's love. And we've been in this, really this series or this theme over the last couple of weeks of Operation Love Others. And each week we've had a specific focus. And each week of the month, we have that same focus. And so now that we're back at the very first week of the month, we're going to focus again on loving your neighbors. If you go on Epic's app or Epic's website, you can see the outreach portion of that, the app. And there, click on Operation Love Others, and it gives you some ideas of ways to be able to intentionally love your neighbor. And if you've got stories to share, you know of somebody else that's doing just a great job of loving their neighbor, share that story with us. There is power in being able to share stories and celebrate with one another. One of the things that we do is we not only love others and intentionally live out God's love, not just in our community, but we look for ways to love others intentionally around the world. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been sharing about this community named Chianes in the mountains of Ecuador. And here's just a fun fact. Uh, we took this trip actually several years ago, and it was where some of us got to meet Pastor Ana Cristina for the very first time. Now, we've done several trips over the years, but that trip stands out in my mind because I got to meet the girls that I sponsor in this community called Chianes. We got to meet Pastor Ana Cristina. We got to make memories together. And I know several of you sponsor kids in this community, but as a church family, we sponsor the entire community, the mothers and the babies. And through your sponsorship and through Epic coming alongside this location, they're able to provide discipleship opportunities for these women. They provide medical care, they provide food, and really come alongside to love and to encourage and to support. And so if you are interested in being a part of that, we raise money every year, and that covers the cost for the entire year. You can simply go on Epic's app or Epic's website and give there with the memo Chianes or Ecuador, and we will make sure that it gets to the right place. Now, next week, we're so excited because we're going to be starting a brand new message series, and I want to invite you to be a part of that. Invite your friends. It's simple. Just share the link with them as well. But I want you to know that it's through your generosity that we're able to partner with what God is doing. He is working in incredible ways here in our community. He's working in individuals' lives. You're going to hear those stories later on, not just here, but he's working abroad as well. And so be a part of what God is doing. Be a part of the movement of what God is doing in people's lives. Invite others to be a part of that. 
Well, I'm so excited because with the gift of technology, Pastor Anna Christina, who was on staff with us with, for several years here at Epic, she is now one of our partners abroad that Epic supports down in Ecuador in the capital city of Quito. And praise the Lord for technology. She is actually going to be sharing the message this morning from Ecuador. And so before she joins us, I'm going to go ahead and pray for our morning together. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. Thank you for this morning. We just say thank you for the gift of technology that allows us to connect no matter where we're at, in various states, in various countries across the globe, and we get to gather together to praise your name, Jesus, to be reminded of your faithfulness and your goodness and the way that you are moving in hearts and lives across the world. God, I pray this morning as you are speaking through Pastor Anna Christina. Holy Spirit, would you speak to each of our lives? Would you encourage and challenge and inspire us to continue making disciples who make disciples who make disciples? Jesus, we love you and we commit all of this gathering to you right now. And it's in your powerful name that I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone at Epic. It is so good to be with all of you despite the distance. Welcome to my home in Quito, Ecuador. I wish you all could be here with me enjoying this sunny Sunday morning, but I am just glad we still get to connect. I have absolutely loved this series. If you have missed one message, I highly encourage you to go back and listen. It has been challenging and wonderful to hear how everyone here at Epic is focused on making disciples who make disciples. After all, that is what it's all about. And I think that this is so important to me because it's the story of my life. As Carleen shared, I learned about spiritual conversations because I had many with Pastor Carleen and Pastor Jeremy and Anne. I saw how they cared about things that were different and it made me question how I, what I was focusing my life on. I remember having so many wonderful conversations with them on that trip that she just mentioned back in 2015 when they came for the first time. I remember that they made such an impact that I even wrote on my journal. These people are different. They know something that I don't and I want to know it. Many of you might remember my first year at Epic. I went there as an intern and I spent most of my time following Carlene and Jeremy's every step. Now, there's a funny story with that because Carlene showed me mercy when I would have kicked myself. See, it was my first couple of months in Indiana and not only was I getting used to the weather, I was also becoming familiar with my automatic car. I had driven a manual transmission for most of my life. So I was there learning about the snow and also how to drive in it. And so I went to the supermarket this one day and my car won't release the key. It didn't make any sense to me. That doesn't happen in a manual transmission car. You just, when you're done, you take it out and that's it. And so I called Carlene in a frantic cry for help because I was scared, it was getting dark, it was snowing so much and I could see myself just frozen in that parking lot. And so she gets there to my rescue. <laughs> and I remember her sweet face of mercy when she reached into my car and all she did was just put it in park and boom, the key was released. And I know that I gave her the biggest, I am so sorry look, and I apologize a thousand times. And she truly responded with love, patience, and so much grace. I will never forget it. But see, that is a small example of what everyone at Epic did with me. They looked at me with mercy and saw a potential that only God could have shown them. They were paying close attention to what the Holy Spirit was saying 
and they decided to show love, to speak life, and physically model for me what it meant not only to be a disciple of Jesus, but to make disciples. And so during that time at Epic, I learned two very important things about discipleship. One is that it is all about love. Discipleship is love. We disciple others because we love them and therefore we want to see God transform their lives. Pastor Jeremy has said this, the best thing you can do for someone else is introduce them to the God that loves them. I agree. I love that quote, but I will add something to it. I would say, and the best thing you can witness is the light coming into somebody's um, eyes when they truly understand they are loved by the God of heaven. See, one thing is the introduction and another one is the understanding. Once a person understands they are loved by the God of the universe, they will choose to change their actions, their language, their habits. They will long to be with Jesus and hear his voice. See, it is not just showering with people, showering people with words about the gospel. God has called us to be part of the process to stick around and see that seed take root and start growing. See the first leaves and then the flowers take shape. Be amazed by the beauty of those colors and then we will get to see the fruit. And once there is fruit, it means there is new seed. And so the process starts all over again. That part for us. That process of witnessing is what makes discipleship so amazing for us. Making disciples is a way God has lovingly designed for us to find joy, fulfillment, abundant life. It will give you purpose and encouragement. I think that is part of what Jesus was talking about when, we, when he said this in Matthew 6.33, he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. By discipling others, we are both seeking and advancing the kingdom of God. Now listen, if you are ever at a place of searching for purpose, Shift the question. Instead of asking God, what do you want me to do? Ask him, who do you want me to love? Because love is the start of everything. Love is his presence and direction. Love is what brings transformation. The way we love is supposed to be our personal brand. The thing we are all known for. Jesus is the one that set this challenge in John 13. He said, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will be proof to the world that you are my disciples. Now, this doesn't mean it will be perfect and easy but it will for sure keep us on our toes, dependent on our God and getting to see him in action. Discipleship will deepen our relationship with our father more than anything else because we are constantly running to him on behalf of others or on our own behalf. Asking him questions and searching the scriptures for his answers. So. Since discipleship is based on love, our next key aspect is it cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. 
And this is where we're going to camp out this morning. <laughs> it cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. What do you think is the role of the Holy Spirit in discipleship? See, a couple of weeks ago, Anne shared with us the importance of searching in the Bible as those instructions we need when putting together a piece of furniture, unless you consider them strongly, you might not end up with a desired result. But who prompts us to read certain parts or gives us the interpretation for what that means? That is the Holy Spirit. Then Pastor Carlene reminded us of the importance of having two simultaneous conversations a horizontal one with the person right in front of you and a vertical one with the Holy Spirit. Why is that vertical one such a game changer though? Jesus told his disciples a lot of things about the Holy Spirit. In John chapters 14, 15, and 16, there are plenty of different descriptions of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. I encourage you to read those chapters on your own time. But for this morning, I made a small summary of them. So in those chapter, that chapters, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit, that he will never leave us. The world at large cannot receive him. He teaches us. He reminds us of Jesus's words. He convinces us of sin and announces God's judgment of evil. He guides us into truth and gives us insight on future events. He brings glory to Christ. And so many more things. But for right now, we know that Jesus is in heaven with the Father, which means that his presence and the power of his presence is being carried out by the Holy Spirit. He is described as the advocate, helper, counselor, one to give us guidance. He is the one that convinces our hearts of sin and judgment, but also he is the voice of truth. See, all of those things are very important elements for discipleship. We need people to sense the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and let him work in their lives. Because guys, nothing can be done without him. No spiritual conversation, no story, no nothing will make a difference if it is not done or used by the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be thinking this. No, this addressing the Holy Spirit thing is too intimidating, or I don't really know how to do it, but I have a good idea on how to start this process of discipleship by asking for his input. We need to have a real talk with the Holy Spirit and ask him some, some key questions. So the first question we're going to ask him is, dear Holy Spirit, Break my heart for what breaks yours. This is a risky prayer, though. One that will change your life. Have you ever wondered how God sees you? How he looks at you with mercy for all those mistakes you know you've made. Now, do you think God looks at everybody else with less mercy than you? I don't think so. We are all his children, all in need of his love and mercy and compassion. Jesus modeled this for us. Several times in the gospels, we see how Jesus was moved to compassion or saw them with compassion. In Matthew 9, 36, we read, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Were you at any point of your life confused and helpless? 
Well, Jesus saw that and rescued you from it. So now that he has saved us, we need to put on those lenses of compassion when we look at others. All others. <laughs> no matter what they believe in or, or what their political or ideological view is, no matter their past or their mistakes, we need to keep those lenses of compassion towards others at all times. I found a wonderful and graphic example of this. I want you to pay really, really close attention to the following video. And I'm gonna ask you to look at the difference between, in terms of compassion between Jesus and his disciples. Pay attention. To spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a leopard. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi you cannot. It's disease. You. Peace. Don't turn away from me. I won't. But if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. Thank you. <laughs> Did you see the contrast between the disciples' reaction and Jesus? The don't breathe his air versus Jesus walking up and giving that strong hug. The disciples knew all the things that the Jewish education demanded them to know. They knew the Torah, the law of that time. They knew of the God who had rescued their people and had done so many miracles. They knew it. It was part of their traditions and their identity and culture. However, they sometimes struggle to show mercy and compassion. Can you identify yourself with that? Maybe you know all the classes and all the verses, but Sometimes you forget to keep those lenses of compassion on. And then we see Jesus. That is our model. Not brushing people aside. Look, spiritually, we were just as injured as that leper. Yet Jesus came to our mess and looked at us with compassion, not disdain. Now, I know there are people in our lives that can be difficult to love or show compassion for. But Jesus wasn't into giving a specific list. He just told us, love them all and I'll sort them out later. So 
in order for us to be able to disciple others and show them who Jesus is, we are supposed to come close to the mess because that is where the presence of Jesus makes a difference. It is in the midst of that tension that we will get to see the Holy Spirit's work of transformation starting to take place. The second thing we're going to ask the Holy Spirit is, dear Holy Spirit, show me who is ready. Have you ever walked on a plane and seen the mom of a toddler? Have you ever seen anybody more ready for that job? Like, if the kid cries, she will have the toy. If there is something coming out of a nose, she will have a wipey. If there is hunger, she will have the snacks. If there is any sort of mess, she will bring out whatever is needed to clean it up. You see, on that plane, everyone is going on the same direction, gonna get to the same destination and is there with a purpose. But if you pay attention and start looking around, she will stand out because she is ready. You know it, if something goes down, she'll, she'll be ready for it. Okay, Jesus has called us to love, have mercy and show compassion to that entire plane. However, the Holy Spirit can help us identify who is ready, who is at that place of curiosity and willingness to learn. They will stand out. They will be the people who are searching, maybe in the wrong places, but they are searching. They are those who keep asking you questions about what you believe or ask for your input when they are making decisions. And they consider, honestly consider your advice. They are on that same journey of searching as everyone else, but you can tell they are ready for the destination. So those are the people we can invest in the ones we start having spiritual conversations with and we start sharing our stories with them. We invest intentional time with them because we can tell that the Holy Spirit is doing something there and is pointing them out in a crowd. Jesus was obviously quickly to identify those who were ready. That is how we see the story of his discipleship group starting. In John 1, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. See, Jesus went for those who were ready to help spread the word, who were curious and quick to share the good news with those in their circle of influence. Now, there is a very important disclaimer here. The Holy Spirit might lead you to people you would not think are ready or interested, but it is vital that you obey and trust his voice. I have noticed we many times put the Holy Spirit in a beautiful little box where we get to define who he uses and who he doesn't, what he can and cannot do. As long as those boxes exist, we will not be able to hear his voice clearly. So we need to ask him to break those apart, to let him move and flow in our lives however he sees fit. That is how it was for me. When I first started praying about starting a discipleship journey, I asked the Holy Spirit who were those people he wanted me to reach out to. And he kept bringing this friend to mind. 
I wasn't really sure I was hearing well and I kept brushing it off because I didn't know much about her life. But what I did know was that she had had a rough life. She had experienced loss and struggled with addictions and she was a very busy mom. I loved her personality and I could see that the Holy Spirit was doing something in her, but I didn't think that she would be interested in starting this friendship with me. I honestly thought she was gonna laugh at my face, but I kept on having her in mind when I was praying. So I went ahead and scheduled lunch with her. And in a moment of boldness, I told her that I wanted to start an intentional friendship where we would meet regularly to talk about life and learn more about Jesus together. And that I wanted to invite her to be a part of that. And then she started crying not crying, sobbing. And I didn't know what I did wrong. And so I was in that awkward moment of like patting her in the back and then not knowing what was happening. But then she told me she had been praying, pleading to God for someone to start such a friendship with her. She had been curious and she had been searching and she needed community. You don't know what the Holy Spirit has been doing in someone's life and how he has been preparing them for this very moment. So get past your insecurities and even your prejudice. Ask him who is ready and then go for it. Listen to his voice and obey it. If he is making someone stand out in a crowd, trust it. You're not going to regret it. Here's our third question for the Holy Spirit. It's, dear Holy Spirit, how do I pray for them? Guys, prayer is essential as we strive to see the movement of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those with disciples because of two important facts. One, prayer keeps us humble. And two, prayer is a weapon. As I mentioned, we can't always know what is happening in the deepest parts of their hearts, but we can pray for the Holy Spirit to be moving them and nudging them towards himself. One of the reasons why it is important for us to pray specifically for those we disciple is because it is a humble recognition that only the Holy Spirit is the one that brings change. This is not on us. It is 100% the work of God in their hearts, their souls, minds, and spirits. Our role is to be available and willing to intercede, but there are not enough words under heaven that we can say to make someone change. Have you ever had one of those moments when a friend calls you and tells you a problem and you give them an answer worth of a diploma? Like you hang up the phone and you feel so good about yourself because of that much wisdom that you just poured out. And then it's not even a week later and your friend is back in that same situation. Well, that is because our mere words can't bring change on their own. It is only the Holy Spirit that can use them to bring change to their heart. And then from there, habits will be transformed and cycles will be broken. See, we don't disciple people because we think or believe that we can make their lives better because of, oh, if they only did what I told them to do, they wouldn't be in this mess. No. We invest in others and we disciple them because we love them, remember? And once again, our model for this is Jesus. He modeled humble discipleship for us. Think of it this way. Could Jesus have simply fixed them immediately? Yes, 
But did he do it? No. Did he have that attitude of, I can fix you because I am perfect? No. But was he? Yes. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to change their hearts and move them because we humbly recognize that we can't do this without him. Then we use prayer as a weapon for those with disciple because of what we find in Ephesians 6, 12. It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So we need to recognize that it is not the person itself we have to address with our words. It is the evil spirits and rulers and authorities that should be getting bombarded by our prayers. I hope I am not the first one to tell you this, but it is going to be a fight. The enemy will try to attack and bring discouragement, but we can and need to be more intelligent. See his strategies and stand firm in our faith. We pray and we bind any strongholds that are keeping those we love in bondage. That might be depression, anxiety, addictions, fear, or confusion. We need to be the ones to keep the right perspective. This is a spiritual battle. And once we address it in that realm, the physical world will change. This is something that happened here last week. One of my friends who is in a discipleship group with me met Jesus in the summer and is now already praying and actively having spiritual conversations with two of her friends who are far from God. And so last week, she had one of those days when everything negative in her life seemed to get together. She called me and told me so many things that she was upset about and things that weren't fair and how she was doubting her beliefs. We talked and I simply encouraged her to try and recognize where all those thoughts were coming from. And it was as though the light bulb came on. She said, I understand how all of this makes sense. The enemy is attacking me because of the potential I have of teaching these other girls about Jesus. If he gets me to stop believing, their process will stop too. And so we talked about the spiritual world and what the enemy was using against her. She identified it was the spirit of negativity and unbelief and she renounced them and rebuked them and asked the Holy Spirit to speak truth in her life. Guys, this is what we would consider a baby Christian. <laughs> but she needed to be made aware of the real fight that is happening around her. As days went by, things got better and she was able to get over that situation and recognize that the Holy Spirit revealed to her really clearly the strategy that the enemy was using against her. So we need to keep prayer right at the center as we reach out to others. Our final point for the Holy Spirit today is, dear Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you. As we help others know Jesus better, it is important to keep a mindset of thankfulness. As mentioned in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says, don't worry about anything because it is not in our shoulders, remember? Instead, pray about everything. So we pray to stay humble and we pray to fight. Tell God what you need. You can ask him all of these questions. And then, and thank him for all he has done. 
then, only then, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Discipleship is a loving path God has designed for us to find peace, humility, and a close relationship with him. So we thank the Holy Spirit for many things, but at least for these three things. One, because through discipleship, we get the front row seat to watch the people you love be transformed and freed from the bonds of the enemy. That is an awesome thing to watch. We also thank him because you will be able to identify with more clarity the voice of God. When you're constantly asking him to tell you what to say to others, his voice becomes really familiar. And there is nothing better than knowing that you can hear clearly from him. And three, because your purpose is unshakable. No matter where you live, where you work, if you don't work, Wherever you are and in whatever you're doing, the purpose of your life will remain unchanged. God will bring different people and circumstances so that his name can be glorified and more people can come to know him. But you, you will continue being a key piece in his kingdom coming. I want to invite you to go to your online connection card or just write down these next steps that we're going to talk about. The first one is, what is God telling you through this message? If there is a way that we can pray for you in this, uh, we would appreciate if you share it. Epic takes this really, really seriously and we love to pray for your needs. So if there's anything there, just let us know. The, ne the next one is, do a self-evaluation. Are there areas of your life or groups of people you are not showing compassion for? Now, God will make that really clearly. And once he does that, ask him to show you a creative way to make that change. Then, number three, ask the Holy Spirit these four important questions. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Show me who is ready. Show me how to pray for them. And thank you for using me. And the last one is when, not if, when he shows you who is ready, go for it. Move to action. Start practicing asking questions and sharing your stories and start praying intentionally for that person. As we close out this series about discipleship, I want to leave you with this phrase that I heard at a training and it truly put discipleship in perspective for me. It says, if the book of life is a novel instead of a list, if it tells the story of those who enter the cosmic battle against darkness, Will your name be there for pages and pages or as a footnote? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you because today we have a new opportunity to show your love to others. Thank you because no matter where we are at or whatever we are doing, Father, we have the opportunity to share your love and look at others with your compassion. Father, I pray that you would move our hearts, that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, that we would be able to look at people with mercy and with the love that you look at them. And Father, I also pray that we would be moved to action. Holy Spirit, we welcome your voice in our lives. We welcome your move in our hearts. We ask you to tell us with clarity who are the people around us that are ready, that are searching, that are curious, and that just they just need somebody to show that they care and that they love them. 
Father, thank you for all the people that you've put in our circles that are in that place that they are ready. We pray that you continue moving their hearts towards you, that you continue nudging them and, and putting questions in their minds. And I pray that you give us the awareness to know how to reach out to them and how to show them your love and your grace. I thank you, Father, because I know that this discipleship journey is a wonderful invitation that you are the only one who could have designed it because of how much you love us. And so I pray, Lord, that as we finish this series, you would bring all the things that we've learned, bring them to our minds, remind them to us constantly so that we can see a movement of multiplication starting to take place, that all of us listening to this message, message will be moved to speak out, to reach out, to do things differently in order to show your love to others. And that through that, we would be able to witness disciples making disciples making disciples for your glory and for your honor. We love you, Jesus, and we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Anna Christina. You know, as she was sharing that message, it's incredible to me because as I think about ways that I've seen this practically lived out, I see the story of Jeff Faust, who's standing behind me with Matt Zimmerman and Chris Persing and their entire small group. And you need to know there is so much history here because over this past year, yes, in many ways, things have been shut down. And sure, COVID has changed our lives. And yet there are individuals who have grown and they have gone deeper in their walks with Jesus. There are individuals who have taken their own personal discipleship so seriously and they're making disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples and they're in a small group together and we've talked about small groups and the value of small groups but looking from the outside in on this small group i can tell you that they embody what it means to do life together to love one another really well to encourage to support to to be there for the really good times and for the really hard times and so I don't want to just be able to share things from the outside. I want them to be able to share with you. So I'm going to let Jeff Faust share his story. And then Matt and Chris, who are part of his small group, are going to baptize him. And we're all going to celebrate together. Hello, Epic family. So I was baptized as an infant and I was raised as a Catholic. Um, and even though I, I attended the required classes for Sunday school and was confirmed at my first communion, um, I really didn't learn the meaning behind what I was doing. Uh, to me, and sadly, I think to a lot of Catholics, it was just a ritual of routine that's expected if you go to this type of church. I knew from a young age that God was real um, for that matter, I knew Satan was real as well, but Jesus really wasn't a part of the picture. Sin was just something that you would get in trouble for if your parents found out about it. And it was easily taken care of if you went to confession that week and, and said a few prayers. So as I got older and I stopped going to church, um, I easily rationalized my sin as a lot of people do. I'm still a good person. I still do all these good things for people. I had compartmentalized God to a thought or a good deed rather than thinking and knowing that he was going to judge me for everything in my life. I'm so fortunate to have people in my life that were followers of Jesus and kept turning me back to the way, living for Jesus at work and at home. Even so, when you don't adopt this mindset for yourself, uh, the evil one will find a way to corrupt these positive influences and make you think that you can do what you please. And I did just that, whatever I pleased. Uh, I was a liar, a thief, lustful, covetous, fooling myself into thinking that I could serve two masters while really only serving the evil one. Everything I did Every evil thing I did was a way for Satan to increase his hold on me and making me feel like I could never be forgiven. I tried to numb myself through many different methods, but in all this, 
I never forgot the people who were trying to point me back to Jesus. God kept them in my heart, even some in my life, praying for me, trying to lead me to the truth. My cousin, Matt Zimmerman, is one of those people. Uh, Jack Walters, who has gone to be with Jesus now, is another. Um, there are others that I'm not mentioning, probably don't even know about, and I praise God for all of them, and I thank God for all their prayers. And even though this sounds weird, I thank God for the internet, because in spite of the evil that people put out there, I found resources from apologetic ministries that solidified Jesus' story for me. Uh, they showed me the historic truth behind the things that I had learned as a kid and answered all the questions that made me doubt God and the Bible. The facts of history and Jesus don't change, only our feelings about them do. Now that I've come to realize the truth, I'm so thankful for the Epic family and especially the small group that I have here that my fiance and I are in. Um, every week I see how God links the personal studying that I do to each Sunday message. Our small group discussions are always intense, in depth, and very personal as we're learning to share each other's lives and really care for each other. I encourage all of you who haven't done this to try to find a group of people who believe and trust in Jesus and really share with them. Since God has opened my eyes and through Jesus broken the chains that Satan placed on me, I've realized God's holiness and perfection. Thank you, Jesus. I realize nothing I could ever do would make up for the evil I've contributed to this world. There's no good deed I can do that will ever make me right before God. So I repent. I acknowledge my sinful nature, and I'm seeking each moment of every day to turn away from that and keep my eyes on Jesus through reading the Bible and through constant prayer. I accept Jesus Christ as the perfect the perfect and free gift to reconcile me to God. Without Jesus, we'd all be lost in this fallen world. His was the greatest sacrifice and our only way to salvation. Thank you, Jesus. I'm getting baptized today before you to honor the Great Commission and as a physical symbol of being committed and obedient to Jesus. I'm also committing myself to spreading the good news about the grace of God. And I have had the privilege of knowing Jeff for oh, uh, 40 some years. <laughs> uh, he's a couple months older than I am. Uh, and throughout that time, you know, as you're growing up as cousins, um, we experienced life together. And it wasn't until uh, further on that after I got out of the army, uh, I of course had derailed my path to God on my path to God as well. And I'm thankful for my cousin for actually helping push me back towards that way. Um, uh, just him asking me questions about the Bible and stuff that I had grown up with, you know, um, and that pushed me back towards God. And I'm so grateful for that because without him, I wouldn't be here as well, uh, um, at least at this stage. Um, throughout life, though, and, and, and hanging out with Jeff as older adults, I could definitely see the fingerprints of God on his life, um, his heart towards others, his attitude. And um, it's as Paul says in, in the Bible, it's a race, and Jeff has continued to run. He's made steps, and this is one of them in his relationship with God. Um, and I believe that one day uh, he'll finish a course and, and win, win the prize. And so I am so thankful that this is one step in many um, as we continue on life's journey. Now, Jeff, share with us your profession of faith. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I renounce Satan, his host, and all his works and ways in my life. I renounce Satan, his host, and all his ways and works in my life. I commit myself to Jesus. I commit myself to Jesus. Christ and his kingdom. Christ and his kingdom. Jeff, based on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
And so we get to finish out this morning, just celebrating together with what God is doing. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and release you to your breakout rooms and we'll continue celebrating together as a small group here. Take care everyone, we love you.